Okay, we are going to be blessed by Mr. Art Williams bringing us the first message for today, a message entitled Reality versus Hope, Part 2. No, it is. No, it is. All right. It was, it, it was sleeping. You never know about these microphones. Okay. <clears throat> Reality versus hope, part two. Last time, we went through how reality of today impacts our future beliefs and hopes for the resurrection and redemption through our Savior. And there's another facet of that that I want to cover today. And that facet is the aspect of hope in our daily life and not focusing out um, who knows how many years, decades out into the future. Because By integrating hope into the reality of today, then we can focus more on our Savior and what God has in store for us. And it helps build our heart into what he wants us to be and helps build our faith. Because hope is more than just belief. You know, for some people, belief is nothing more than blowing out the candles on a birthday cake and making a wish or throwing a coin into a fountain and making a wish. But it's much more than that. Belief is a beginning, but it's only the beginning. Because as James tells us, we have to have living faith, the faith that we demonstrate in our life, that we practice. And showing our faith by our works, by our actions, what you do, how you do it, It's all very basic to us. We all know these things. Uh, It's walking by faith, not by sight. But on a more complicated part, we have to know or have the wisdom and increase our knowledge of God about who he is, what he is, how he makes his decisions, what he's doing, so we can be in harmony with his will. Because... Life does get complicated. We'll look at some of those complications here in just a little bit. We have to come to understand what he will or won't do, his purpose, his will. And sometimes we don't have a very good visibility on that or we don't have a very good understanding. I didn't hear a crash. I guess we didn't crash. (laughs) That bomb always falls out of the sky, but it never blows up, you know? (laughs) But there are also situations that are bigger than individuals. You know, the problems in in life sometimes are depending on where you live. If you live in a country that's dominated by anti-Christian flavors, if you will, you're going to have a whole set of different problems than someone that lives in a freer country where Christianity is readily accepted. So the question is, in your daily living, do you apply faith? And if so, in what ways? And could you apply faith more in many different areas. And perhaps, I know in my own life, I have 
drifted away some of the things that I used to uh, pray about and looked for in faith. I guess maybe because I figure it's not important or eh, it's, everything's going to work out in that area or that aspect of my life. We shouldn't really get into that attitude, I don't think, though. We should have living faith. And faith in, includes trust. It includes confidence in him. Um, and indeed, some decisions we handle without his intervention. We, because we know the Proverbs, we understand the Proverbs, we understand how to make those decisions. But when it comes to faith and hope, it's more than birthday cakes and candles and a fountain in the park. In Colossians 1.10, we're told to learn more about God. And many different ways that we can learn about him. Of course, one of those is how he loves us, but also how he loves other people. One of the probably more difficult things to deal with is the fact that God does not rejoice in the death of the wicked. I tend to want to do that, you know? It's a tough one. But we kind of understand that when we realize that, uh, as there was recently on a television show, how the person didn't believe in God and was hostile even to the concept because his three children were killed in an auto accident. And that same person who killed accidentally his three children later on was intimate in saving the life of some other people. So sometimes I can look at it and I feel like I'm a lamb for the slaughter, a, a sacrificial pawn to help in the development of unbelievers sometimes. It almost seems that way. But then it's his will, and that goes to what are we holding on to? You know, we can't take it with us, but we sure can hold on to it real tight. You know, are we going to like hold on to it so tightly that we put in our will that we have it placed in our casket with us? <laughs> I don't think any of us would really do that. In Luke 18, 18, I'm going to turn there. I'm sorry, 18.8. Hmm, that's not what I wanted either. The scripture that I was looking for is the one where Jesus said, oh yeah, there it is, it's an 18.8, the last part. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, speaking about his revenge for the elect. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith, faith on the earth? That is a very, very, I think, significant scripture that goes to the attitudes of people come the time of the end. It's a very significant almost a warning. When we look at the letters to the seven churches, we find that most of them are put through what they're put through to try and test their faith. There's one church, however, that there is no fault found, and they still go through it. They probably live in the belly of the beast just like somebody that would be living in an anti-Christian country today, 
the situations are a little bit different for them. And then there's those that are protected through it. So the level of our application of faith, if we were to evaluate it now by ourselves on a scale of 1 to 10, and we have a, a scale over here like weighting where you put a, something on there to weigh it, what do you think your measure of faith would be? Would it be 1 or would it be 10, 10 being the highest in your daily life of applying faith with what you say, what you do. Jesus made some promises to us, and this is where it gets complicated and very complex. In John 14, 13, John 14, 13, I'm going to turn there. He makes a very interesting statement, and it seems to be unqualified. Whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The only qualification there is that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Otherwise, it's unqualified, isn't it? Or is it? Because there's more to that statement. If we turn over to John 15, 16, John 15, verse 16, I have not chosen, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, that your fruit shall remain. And whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So here now, that promise is connected to bringing forth fruits. Spiritual growth requires faith, daily faith. And if we go to John 16, 23, we get... a a little bit more of the same insight here. And in that day you ask me nothing, verily, veil, verily I say unto you, whatever you shall ask in, my, in the Father's, ask the Father in my name, he will give it unto you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be fulfilled. So here it's fulfilling of joy and growing fruits two of the qualifications for the unanswered prayer. And he goes on, and he makes another statement. And this one, again, is interesting. In back in Matthew, I'm sorry, it's in Mark 16, 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. So here we have a statement that you can pick up snakes and you can drink poison and it won't hurt you. Now this statement was made to the disciples. Question, does it apply to us today? Do you think you could hurt, pick up deadly things or drink poison? and not be hurt by it. Well, I know of some personal examples, and this is part of the complexity that I was talking about earlier. There are two people, one of his names, Bob, many, knew him many, many years ago up in Chicago. And he came to church one day, and he, he said, the doctor told me that the pain in my side that I've been complaining about for the last two or three weeks is appendicitis. He says, I need an operation. And he says, I'm not going to have it. God says, you'll heal me? You'll heal me. He was healed. Another person a family member had appendicitis. And he said, no. I want God to heal my family member. 
a family member died. What's the difference? From the insight that we got in the scriptures that we just saw, one has to go, has to do with growing fruits and joy. Does that somehow fit in to the events here of the appendicitis? I don't have an answer I definitely would hang my hat on. But I do think that when we get an answered prayer, it has something to do with our attitudes internally. He has big purposes that he's working out. And the more humble we are, the closer we are, the more we apply faith, hope, confidence, and trust in our daily life, the more of an attitude we're going to have that's in harmony with what he would like to have. And I think therein, barring any greater unforeseen purpose, we would be more fitting into the growth of fruits. There's another example, and I've used this once before, and I know this person personally, and worked for a contractor out in Locust Grove. And one day he was out with a group of people from his Sunday keeping church and they were cutting down trees that had fallen on this lady, uh, widow's property. And he wants to take a rest and he puts his arm up on this tree. He never saw the deadly snake that was up there. And the snake nails his arm like that. And all of his buddies and he's like, we gotta get you to the hospital, come on. I got to get some water, <laughs> excuse me. And to everybody's amazement, he said, no, the scripture says I won't be held, hurt by deadly things. I don't need to go to the hospital. Do you agree? What would you do? Do you have the faith? Or do you think that scripture only applied to the disciples? Long story short, the next day, his arm that got bit was all swollen up. He maintained his faith and didn't say anything. He said, I'm not going to worry about it. It's going to go away. Two days later, he had some side effects in that arm, and it wasn't going down at all. So he went to see a doctor, and the doctor told him, well, there's nothing we can do now. You should have come back in when it happened. Two days later, his arm was completely healed. And there's another example of this young lady. She had two children, she was married, and she was diagnosed with a disease that required that she get a blood transfusion. She did not believe in getting blood transfusions. She said, no, God can heal me, he can fix it. I'm not going to take a blood transfusion. She died. Two children without a mom. So those are some of the conflicting, difficult situations that mankind gets into. And as I said earlier, I think it has to do mainly with our own attitudes, but also it doesn't have to only be that. It can be something more in that he uses people, for example, just like Stephen. Stephen gave his life in doing the work of Jesus. Now I got a real difficult question for you. Don't want any hands raised or anything. I'll tell you before I ask the question, I did not do this. How many of us in this, sitting in this congregation today prayed to God 
to be protected from COVID and relied on God to do that. I did not. But I did take another approach. I don't have a very strong body. I was premature and said, if, told if I lived to be four years old, my heart would heal itself. By age seven, they thought I had tuberculosis because I had such terrible congestion, which I had up until the 1980s when I asked God for his guidance and direction. Went to a bookstore, got a book. It's entitled The Doctor's Encyclopedia for Vitamins and Minerals. And there was more than vitamins and minerals, and there was homeopathics and other supplements. And then I started looking at that to see what I could do to get rid of the congestions and the allergies and everything that I had going on in my life. It was a seven-year process, but when I got done with it, I have very little effects of allergies today. And the one thing I asked of him was his guidance and his instruction. So I didn't take the wrong things, go in the wrong direction. We do the same thing with the immune system and nutrition. I didn't ask him to protect me supernaturally from COVID because I don't think I have the faith to do it. If you don't have the faith, like the woman that reached out and just touched Jesus, and Jesus says, your faith has made you heal, you're whole. You have to have that faith. If you don't have the faith, you can't be quivering on your knees like... Daniel's three friends before the furnace. They, I think God's going to save us. Yeah, yeah. No, you don't have to throw us in there, really, but God's going to save us anyway, you know? No, no, no. It wasn't a big deal to them. It wasn't a big deal to them. Matter of fact, you can throw us in there. God can protect us if he wants to. If he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down and worship you because it's wrong. Very simple. That kind of simple faith, that's what you develop when you look every day to God, to trust in him, look for his guidance, his direction. Going back to the scripture that says that we need to learn more about God. You know, sometimes if you've been in the church 50 years, you kind of look at the Bible and say, well, I know this, I know that. And maybe even as one very popular evangelist said a number of years back on the radio, he said, well, sometimes I hear somebody talk about this, and I already feel myself dozing off. I've heard it so many times. And we can get into those attitudes but there's also many things in this book that we can look at perhaps from a fresh and different perspective and not the same way that we did 10, 15, 20 years ago. And in that, we can learn more about God and learning about him and knowing his purpose for you individually and also on a greater scale the environment that is bigger than you. Because at some point, when the tribulation comes along, that's a big event, that's a big deal. And it's superior to individual. And it comes down to an individual's belief and relationship, interpersonal relationship with God. Now, I don't know whether we'll be alive at the time of the tribulation or not, but even if we're not, um, it goes to a better relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ to apply hope every day and bring hope into the reality of your day every day. Some things that we can pray for, which I must admit that I lack in doing, is just like safety, driving the car. You know, I can't remember the last time I asked him to watch over me as I drive my car, but I don't get it hit by another car, or I don't know what my attitude is if I think it just won't happen to me. It's in my power. 
time and chance can happen to anyone. With those kinds of, of situations. And you can look into your own lives. And some of us have more, shall we say, stressful events in our life. And it's really, really not hard for us to find things to pray about. They're right before our face every morning when we get up. And others of us, oh gee, life is really great. I don't have any problems. I don't know, what do I need to ask God for? You know? Two sides of the coin, extremes. But even if you're in that, gee, I don't have any problems, what about the person that does have problems who God loves just as much as you? What about getting involved in helping them with their problems? And that can be very discouraging, too, and I've been there, done that. One person individually had a miracle that happened right before her eyes, and she was so excited about it. But it also scared her. And she was so scared, she wouldn't take the next step and walk through that open door. It was quite amazing, but it was also quite quite distressing and makes you feel like you've been wasting your time. You put time into helping someone, they're coming along really great, and then you get a really great sign that, wow, this is something you really need to step into and take advantage, and they turn away from it because of fear. Because of fear. And we've heard messages recently on fear. Fear is a big debilitating factor in Christian life and we're admonished to overcome it. And bringing his, bringing him, his hope in him, his trust, having trust in him, confidence in him, every day, is a good way to get there. Apply it, grow with it. And you will have to answer, come up with your own answers to the question of what Jesus will do for you or won't do for you. Will he protect you from snake bites? Will he heal you from an appendicitis attack? What will he do and what he won't do? It's going to be dependent on your relationship with him. He loves you. He's developing you to be a ruler in his kingdom, and to have life eternal beyond that. And that's what he's working towards in everything that he does with you and within your life. So keep that in mind. And i just like to encourage you to bring hope, trust, and confidence in him into your life every day. <laughs>